Good morning, everybody. We're going to get started this morning by reading a little bit from Matthew chapter 4. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted and became very hungry. During that time, the devil came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, no, the scriptures say, people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple and said, if you are the son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say, he will order his angels to protect you and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Jesus responded, the scriptures also say, you must not test the Lord your God. Next, the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I will give it all to you, he said, if you will kneel down and worship me. Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him, for the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil went away and the angels came back and took care of Jesus. Well, my name is James Walker, and I'm here to continue the detox, soul detox series we have. And today's topic, we're talking about noise. And I know if you've known me for four years, or if you've barely interacted with me, or just seen me chasing the kids around in, in uh, the lobby, um, I know your first thought is, that is somebody who at some point in his life played football at a very high level. <laughs> A lot of you who may have known me for four years will be surprised even to hear uh, that I once played football at the University of Washington, and that's a season of life that I often forget about too. Um, and the city of Seattle, the NFL and college football level, it's known for a passionate football base, uh, fan base that makes a lot of sound, and Husky Stadium in particular was built to rattle visiting teams that came into the stadium. So it seats over 70,000 fans, but what's unique about it is almost all of those fans are seated between the goal lines. So they're basically all on top of the players on the field. And then there's these two giant metal overhangs that trap the sound down on the field. Uh, from 1993 to 2023, the loudest decibel level recorded during a college football game was at Husky Stadium. So the record was broke this last fall. I won't say which fan base broke that record, um, but Pastor Brandon would be happy. Well, he is happy to hear about that. Um, I've, I've read that it was the loudest decibel level recorded from humans, like a collection of humans, but I don't believe that. Um, it was a deafening 133.6 decibels, which I don't know what that means. But Google tells me that pain begins at 125 decibels, and a jet engine from 100 feet away is 140 decibels. So it's somewhere between painful and jet engine blowing your eardrums out. Watching on TV or even from the stands, you get a sense of how loud that is. Uh, the TV, like the, the cameras shake during some of these games, but there's no way to know just how crippling that level of noise can be until you're on the field as a target of all that noise. In one game, there was an opponent who looked foolish when he let the ball roll between his legs and he kind of stumbled over it, it was really embarrassing, which is embarrassing enough for me in the backyard with my kids, um, but I'll never forget the sound of 70,000 people laughing in unison at somebody, and I don't know if I could ever recover from that. Now, the point of the crowd making noise is to create a home field advantage that makes it harder for the visiting team to function while also motivating the home team. And there's one game in particular that stands out to me where we were losing by 17 points late in the game. We came back, this great comeback, and we had a lead late in the game. And you could see as the opposing team got the ball late in the game, they were driving to try to score and ultimately win the game. But the fans were like, not today. And the players on the field, we felt that way too. I guess the players on the field had something to do with it. I was just on the sideline. Don't, don't get any ideas. Uh, I never played. Um, but... <laughs> The fans weren't going to let that happen. They were so loud, and it's as loud as I can remember. And I remember physically feeling the ground shake beneath my feet. And I remember looking out on the field, and you could see the opposing team crumbling one by one, starting with the quarterback. You know, he's trying to change plays, and he's walking around, and like in his body language, he put his hands up to his ears, like they were falling apart. They were crumbling under the noise. The whole team was flustered in that chaos-inducing environment. And ultimately, they were unable to make a play, and the Huskies won. 
Now for you, this is not a story just about football. This is a story about noise. And my hope is that for you in describing this experience, you don't imagine yourself on a football field, but you can make the connection of noise to your own life. It may be a literal deafening noise from a variety of sources. It may be ongoing whispers or fears that are a constant presence in your life. Or it may be, a literal loud, it may be literal loud people and media and music in your household or workplace. We all share a noisy world in society and we have the effects of noise in common. To paraphrase a coach who I remember describing the effects of noise on an opposing team, he said that in noisy environments, several things happen, and I think we can find something in common with that, is that one, communication suffers. Two, confusion rises and focus falls. Three, anxiety takes hold. And four, mistakes are magnified. And I wonder if we are aware of the extent to which noise impacts us to how noisy our lives actually are. It may not be 133 decibel levels of pain-inducing noise, but a wall of sound that causes communication to suffer, confusion to rise, it gives anxiety a foothold and magnifies the mistakes of ourselves and of others. Whether we're aware of it or not, we are all impacted by it and we all contribute to it. So this morning, we're gonna talk about three different kinds of noise. There's external noise, internal noise, and then the noise that we make. And the goal for us today is to walk out of here with an awareness of the external noise in our life, uh, with a practice for tuning that noise out that drowns out the voice of God and having practices to slow our minds and tune our hearts to hear God, and ultimately for us to have quieted hearts and mind that enable us to make lovely sounds and proclamations of peace and God's goodness in this world. And we're gonna use Matthew's account of the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness as a model. And by the way, when it says Jesus' temptation in the wilderness, the word wilderness used is the same word used to describe the solitary place that Jesus would often go to to pray throughout the Gospels. And hold on to that thought because we'll come back to it. In this story, the tempter embodies external noise to Jesus. Then we're gonna look at Jesus' response through the lens of internal noise and ultimately the noise that he makes in response. So let's talk first about external noise. The first bit of noise that the tempter brings to Jesus is to question his identity. He says, if you really are the son of God. The external noise in our life can be literal noises. It can be people, it can be spiritual beings, but it doesn't have to be. It comes in the form of information hitting us like a wall of sound. Words and ideas that bounce around and make their way into our hearts and minds that disorient and reorient our hearts and desires. They can discourage us, build us up, tell us who we are, and they tell us a story, but mostly they're too numerous for, numerous for us to even make out what that noise actually is. Today, the average person consumes 74 gigabytes of information per day, which again, doesn't mean a lot to me, so that's the equivalent of about watching 16 movies per day. Or another way of looking at it is that the information we consume today from podcasts to TV shows to ads, etc., the average person consumes the equivalent of 174 85-page newspapers per day, which is far too much information for any of us to process. This information comes in many forms, maybe most significantly in the 10,000 advertisements the average person consumes each day as are, that are telling us what our problems are, what the solutions are, and ultimately what the good life is. With all the media that we consume, both intentionally and unintentionally, our desires are constantly being shaped by external noise. So when we look at Satan, the tempter, in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus has been in the wilderness in a solitary place for 40 days. And perhaps the first external voice, the first external words he hears in 40 days are the words, if you really are the son of God, which is a question of identity. There are years worth of series to do on identity, but this is the first vulnerability that the tempter tries to exploit. But it's also the place of strength that Jesus operates from when he faces temptation. Jesus knows who he is, he knows who the Father says he is and how to operate from that place. The world and the noise of it does not tell Jesus who he is, the Father does. Remember that just before Jesus entered into the wilderness, he was baptized and the Father declared loudly, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And you at your center are a person created to be unblemished, to live a life in all of its fullness in fellowship with the creator of the universe. That version of you has been reshaped and even buried by who others have said you are, by how you've responded to the noise of this world, 
and by trauma and failures and shortcomings and thousands of other sources. So much of the external noise is trying to fundamentally reshape who you are. And this is relevant when we consider the ways in which Satan tempted Jesus. First, he tempts him in the area of provision or safety. He says, if you really are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. Could Jesus have been wondering at that point where his next meal would come from? Would the father let him perish? He had the power to take matters into his own hands, but he remained in his father's will, believing that the father will provide. To take that authority would be contrary to his nature, his identity, and the word that the father had spoken. The tempter taps into Jesus's human fear of survival, a fear that we all share. Will we make rent? Will we get out of debt? Will we be able to afford our medical bills? What about our kids' education and retirement? Inflation's out of control. We're told and we tell ourselves that we need to be afraid and to take matters into our own hands. That external noise stirs up fear and wants us to live and react from a place of fear. And to quote Bruce Springsteen, he says, if what you do to survive kills the things that you love, then fear is a powerful thing. If we allow the noise of the world to call the shots, if we allow fear to call the shots, we will grow in anxiety and lose the things that we love. Yet the voice of the Father promises provision, peace, and fullness of life. We see that in Jesus' response, and we see it lived out in his life and the life of the followers. We've seen it lived out in the lives of countless saints throughout church history, and that's the story that we must listen to. The second area that the tempter approaches Jesus with is in the, the idea of glory and identity where the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple and said, if you are the son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say, he will order his angels to protect you and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Satan is inviting Jesus to take for himself a public demonstration of approval rather than have a quiet confidence in already having the father's approval. You do not need to be celebrated or to position yourself to be celebrated, to be approved and accepted. You have an invitation from the Father, from the God of the universe, that you already are accepted and you're invited to walk in that and to live from that place, not to take it for yourself or to strive for it. The Father glorified and celebrated Jesus when he humbled himself and was baptized like the rest of us by a man who said, I'm not even worthy to loose your sandals. The voices of this world are telling you what to do to be great, to make yourself known, what to do to be accepted. But the Father is telling you that he knows you he sees you, and in him you are perfectly seen, perfectly known, and you belong. In following him, you get to share in his eternal glory. Listen to the voice of God. God loves you, God accepts you, God approves of you. You do not need to pursue external validation or celebration from others because you already have it. And the third way that the tempter approaches Jesus is in power and authority. Now, there's never been a greater or more influential person in history than Jesus Christ. He would have been the greatest king in the history of the world. But what a tragedy would it would be if he were merely the greatest king in the history of the world. Instead, and I can't wait for us to go through the Sermon of the Mount and the series this summer, Jesus launches an eternal kingdom that is above all things. And it's for all people where the outcasts, the marginalized, the down and out have a home. It's not about who's at the top of the totem pole in our world systems, it's about the kingdom of God. So for some of us, the temptation to power and authority and safety in the midst of that is political noise that comes to us in the form of cable news, talk radio, podcasts. It may be time to turn down that volume or just turn it off altogether, especially in this coming year. And just as a aside, one of the best things I've done in the last couple years is get off of social media and stop reading news on my phone uh, I only read the Sunday paper, and my wife makes fun of me for it. Uh, <laughs> I am still a young man. Uh, <laughs> it is so refreshing to go through the week and to hear people talking about all the gnarly things that are happening in the world and to not really know what's going on. And then at the end of a week, when people have had time to process, to read something in long form and slow things down and be like, oh, I understand. I feel so much peace and so much less reactionary in the midst of that. I highly encourage you to take part in the slow news movement. <laughs> but that was an aside. For me, as a leader in a Christian school, when we talk about power and authority, 
This temptation comes in the form of losing the vision of what true success looks like. I don't wanna shape a school in my understanding of what the best school is. Even if it becomes known as the best school in the world, and there are great test scores and students going to the most prestigious universities. I wanna be faithful to what God has for me and for us. I wanna play a different game that echoes into eternity, far beyond present success. To put it another way, for us as individuals, what good is it to a person to gain the whole world, yet lose their soul? In all of this, the world is telling us a story both directly and indirectly, a story that shapes our identities, our goals, our fears, and our desires. And yet at the same time, the Father is telling us a story, directly and indirectly, that also shapes our identities, our goals, and our desires. And it replaces our fears with courage. So take note of this. Not all external noise is bad, because the Father also tells a story. He is always speaking, but his voice is so often drowned out by the noise of this world. Some of this noise is unintentional and unavoidable. Some of it is our own making. So my encouragement to you is to turn down the literal volume on some external noise. Take an audit of the media you are consuming and what it does to you. Turn some of it off. Take stock of the stories you are listening to and believing both about the world and yourself. And reflect on what Pastor Brandon talked about last week about phones and technology. Those are a huge source of external noise. Turn them off, put them away. And as we talk about the world being noisy, remember that the Father is always making noise. He is always speaking. The question is, are we listening and can we hear it? Last week, Gina closed us out with a blessing reading from Zephaniah 3.17. For the Lord your God is living among you. He is a mighty savior. He will take delight in you with gladness. With his love, he will calm all your fears. He will rejoice over you with loud singing. And as we reflect on that, we move into the second type of noise being internal noise. In Matthew chapter four, we don't see Jesus' internal thoughts. We read of the external noise and his response to it. And I would argue that from what we read, the external noise that Jesus makes matches the internal noise that he has. Jesus is the word of God. He embodies the word of God and he speaks the word of God. From what we can tell, Jesus was not in the wilderness with a collection of scrolls. The tempter did not come to Jesus, who, who hears the temptation, and he sets his scrolls out on the ground and says, oh, where it is it say something about bread and God's word from the mouth? Like, no, he responds. He knows and he responds. For us, in the same way, scripture is more accessible to us than it ever has been, which is wonderful. But if it's only an external source and an external noise to us that's not internalized and embodied, then we're gonna be in trouble. So when temptation arises and we say, oh, hold on, hold on, let's see. Uh, Bible app, great. Word search, bread. Oh, which bread is that? I have to go a long ways before I get to the right version of bread, right? And in all of that time, <laughs> we're creating more and more space to fall into that temptation and to believe another story. But when we sit <laughs> in fellowship with the Father so that the word of God isn't an external noise, but it's also internalized in us, that's what we're after. When faced with, the, with temptation, we wanna respond from our core, from our depths with the word of God. It is good to, it's good to access God's word externally, but if it's not internalized, we're gonna find ourselves in some trouble. So where Jesus knows the word of God, he knows God's will, and he knows his own purpose to his core, Satan appeals to his shallow hungers, but Jesus is not drawn to that because he does not live in the shallows. His response is the fruit of his spiritual state and his emotional health. In the wilderness, in a state of desperate hunger, he responds with strength and confidence without angst, wavering, or whining. He doesn't bargain or question anything. He doesn't look and say, oh, if I could turn those stones into bread, what would that mean for my purpose and ministry? What if I turn these stones into unleavened bread? How could this be perceived? What if I create bread and I bless it? What if I create more bread than I need and find somebody to give that bread to? Right? He doesn't try to justify, he doesn't wrestle with that. And I know if I'm in those situations, I try to entertain quite often and justify myself. But he responds with the word of God as the word of God embodied. And I mentioned earlier that the word for wilderness here is the same word used for a solitary place that's seen throughout the New Testament. In his ministry, Jesus often retreats to a solitary place to pray for the night, to hear from the Father. He retreats with his disciples to a solitary place 
After his disciples go out two by two and return from their ministry journeys, he tells them to go to a solitary place, a deserted place, a wilderness, a place away from the external noise to silence your thoughts and converse with the Father. We must get away from the external noise so we can actually come to terms with our internal noise and take that noise to the Father. In many ways, the external noise is the easy part to deal with because we can turn a lot of it off and get away from it to some extent. But the angst and fear and anxiety that the external noise plants in us is not easy to escape, which is why we lay down at night and our minds race and it's hard to sleep. Why do we constantly feel, feel the need to fill the silence in our lives? Why do we look at our phones when waiting in line at the grocery store? The world we live in has trained us, and we have also trained, our, trained ourselves to have noisy inner lives. And I can't face the noise of this life with any peace if my inner life is noisy. Even the noise of my kids playing and laughter is too much for me to handle when I'm overwhelmed with chores at home at the end of a long, stressful day. How can I expect to function with any peace in challenging situations when my own thoughts are constantly racing and speaking the same lies that the tempter approached Jesus with? Enter the practice of solitude, of willfully stepping into a deserted place away from the noise to take our internal noise into the presence of the Father and exchange our own noise for the words he speaks over us and to us. We know that we cannot exchange our chaotic thoughts with the strong and peaceful thoughts of the Father without solitude because Jesus himself could not function as a human without going into the wilderness, a deserted place. If Christ needed solitude, how much more do we? And in the practice of solitude, I encourage each of us to make it a daily pr practice where we find even a brief window of silence to sit in the presence of the Father. For me, this looks like early mornings before the family gets up, late nights after the kids are in bed, and even brief windows of time throughout the day where I close my office door, shut the blinds, turn down the lights, and literally lay flat on my face and plead with God to let me hear his voice and remind me of who I am and what this life is all about. This has been a fantastic and transformative practice for me that I've pursued and found to be very filling. I encourage each of you to start with just two minutes a day in silence, intentionally away from the noise and all other people. And from the example of Jesus and from the examples throughout church history of exercising the discipline of solitude, it's so much more than just a few minutes throughout the day. We see in Jesus' ministry full nights of prayer, multiple days away, and even 40 days in a solitary place. I'm not great at seeking extended solitude, though I will say a rhythm of daily solitary moments is something I can speak to. So because of the extended solitude, I looked at some examples of others, and I found a common example that looks something like daily solitude of 30 minutes a day, monthly solitude of one afternoon per month, quarterly solitude of one night away, and yearly solitude being multiple nights away. Yes, solitude is for you. This is to find peace and courage to come to terms with who you are, who God made you to be, who God says you are, to quiet and align the inner noise in your life with the external noise of the Father. Not, not just for you, but it's also for others. To quote Thomas Merton who said, we do not go into the desert to escape people, but in order to find them. We do not leave them in order to have nothing to do with them, but to find out the best way to do them the most good. Which takes us to the last point of the noise that we make. What noise did Jesus make? Not only did he resist temptation by using the word of God, but he gave us an example to continually gather strength to live fully and defeat temptation. This time in the wilderness was the launching point for his ministry. Shortly after that, he delivers the Sermon on the Mount and establishes the kingdom of God in our present age. Jesus came out of the desert and made a whole lot of noise. He's still making that noise today, and he invites us to join him in making that noise. But we need to reflect on what that noise is too. Is the noise we make contributing to the anxiety and chaos of the world around us, or is it countering that noise for the edification of one another? to encourage others to hear the voice of God and sense his presence and the idea that he's always speaking? Do we carry a non-anxious presence in our family, our neighborhood, and our workplaces, or do we stir things up? When you find internal peace, when you have internal peace, you bring external peace. You counter the chaotic external noise and become a conduit for the voice and presence of God. The goal is not for others to hear your voice all the time, but direct, to, to direct people to the presence of the Father, knowing when that doesn't involve a multitude of your own words, is discovered in being tuned with the Holy Spirit 
and the voice of the Father in every moment. People don't always need to hear what you know or what you believe is right or wrong or biblical or not. People do need to be brought into the presence of the Father by people who are at peace with the Father and live from that place. So we are all part of the external noise. The question is, what is the noise that we are making? Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 13, if I could speak all the languages of the earth and of angels, but don't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. He would be annoying. If our heart is not rightly aligned with God, we are making noise from a place of internal chaos and we contribute to the chaotic noise of our world where we can be at best useless and at worst break communication, cause confusion, incite anxiety, and magnify mistakes. Even a holy noise can be useless or misleading. I think of a story in 1 Samuel chapter four, when the priests of Israel were two corrupt, bribe-accepting, sexual-assaulting, self-exalting priests who brought the Ark of the Covenant into Israel's camp. They said, God is with us and will lead us to victory if we bring the Ark. So they bring the Ark of the Covenant into their camp and the Israelites go crazy. They raise such a great sound, it says, that the ground itself shook. And the Philistines are nearby and they hear that noise and they're afraid, but they look at each other and say, let's go get these guys. Let's be strong. And it stirs them up to strength to attack. So the Philistines go in, they fight, they slaughter the Israelites, they kill the corrupt priests of Israel and they capture the Ark of the Covenant. And the chapter ends with the woman declaring, the glory has departed from Israel for the Ark of God has been captured. What well, starts with a great noise and the entrance of the Ark of the Covenant ends with the glory of God has departed from Israel because God was not in that noise. God was not with the corrupt leaders of Israel who are trying to claim God on their own terms. That reminds me of when God spoke through the prophet Amos and said, I hate all your show and pretense, the hypocrisy of your religious festivals and solemn assemblies. I will not accept your burnt offerings and grain offerings. I won't even notice all your choice peace offerings. Away with your noisy hymns of praise. I will not listen to the music of your harps. Instead, I wanna see a mighty flood of justice, an endless river of righteous living. Now, this is not to start to close out the message by saying, so therefore, don't make noise. Don't sing worship. God does not hate worship. He does not hate our noise. He doesn't hate a noise that makes the ground shake. He doesn't hate noisy hymns of praise. But when the noise ends in itself, he hates that. When we make a noise that is from a place of corruption and injustice, where we are, whether we know it or not, are taking, <laughs> taking the invitation that the tempter has for us to take sustenance on our own, to take glory and power for ourselves and bringing God's name into it and baptizing it with worship. That's, that's what he doesn't want, right? He wants praise, authentic praise and loud noises that come from a place of fellowship with him where we seek him in a solitary place in our own wilderness where we hear God and align our hearts with his voice and live from that place where we are contributing to the restoration of all things, where we are contributing to justice and portraying the heart of God. He wants a noise from that place. So we look at Christ in the wilderness, confident and fearless, knowing who God has declared him to be, trusting God for his sustenance, standing confidently in his acceptance by God, and fully trusting God's plan for restoring all things. The noise of Jesus brings peace, healing, justice, and restoration, and as his followers, we are invited to do the same in the way we live, in the way we speak, and in the way we sing. So as we start to close this out, there's external noise in this world that both distracts us and tells a story. Some of this noise is unavoidable and some of it's avoidable. Let's all take an audit of the noise in our life, what we can turn down and what we can turn off. There's an internal noise inside of each of us. We must develop rhythms of solitude. Reflect on where you can practice solitude on daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, and yearly basis. And lastly, we all contribute to the noise of this world. What is the noise that we are making? Does it come from a place of internal peace and health? What we do and do not speak ought to counter the noisiness of this world and magnify the voice and presence of God. 
So what is the noise that we are making? And one of the best practices I can encourage for you is to begin to read or increase how much you read and to read well and to read deeply and to sit in it. Read scripture, read great books. But right now there's also one immediate action that I'm gonna invite all of us to right now. But I first want you to hear my heart in this. I have two fears really in being up here today. Uh, one is that I fail miserably, that I step into heresy or you stumble over my words and you walk out of here wondering what just happened. I'm pretty confident that this has been average at worst. My greater fear is that I knock this thing out of the park and you all walk out of here with a sense of satisfaction because you just heard a fantastic sermon. <clears throat> Once upon a time and not too long ago, I used to gauge my spirituality on the quality of content that I consumed. The good books I read, listening to the best podcasts, sitting under, under great preaching and worshiping with the best songs, with the greatest musicians, like that was a, an accomplishment to me. I don't want this Bible study to be another shout in the echo chamber of this world, even if it's a good one. I want this to be an invitation into something that you will participate in, an invitation to a life that is spent turning, tuning your ear to hear God's voice and living a life in that place. And worship through song is a big part of that. We gather weekly and we sing together, which is kind of a strange thing. Not a lot of groups of people do that. It's a beautiful thing, and candidly, I don't always love it, but I need it. And when it lands, it moves me and draws me closer to God. If I'm being honest in this, I need your voice. I need to hear you sing because it stirs me and invites me into worship. And you need my voice. And when we all realize that and sing for each other and with each other to God, that's when you make a beautiful noise that counters the chaotic noise of this world, brings internal peace, and enables us to be aware of the presence of God. And that is the place we live from. So as we close out in song, I'm inviting you, I'm pleading with you. Will you please sing louder than you are comfortable? Because we need to hear it and I need to hear it.